everlasting life we find in Christ. The candles also have their own special significance. The four candles are lit on the four Sundays of Advent, and they represent the hope, peace, joy, and love of the Advent season. The middle candle is the Christ candle, and, it's lit, it's, and, it, and it is lit on Christmas Eve to recognize the Christ Advent brought, uh, the, to recognize that Christ's Advent brought the true hope, peace, joy, and love to our world. Last week, we lit the first Advent candle, the hope candle. Today, we light the second candle of Advent, the peace candle. As we light the peace candle, we remember that God promised to send a Prince of Peace to a world in, des in desperate need of peace. So the scripture is Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be... I'm sorry, let me... I'm having problems here with the... I'm start again. Uh, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and, a, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as... As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold the, sin, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marco. As we go into God in prayer, um, I, haven't worn a, uh, I haven't worn a tie in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, yes, and so it's kind of choking my neck. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to loosen it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to all the men who wore ties as well. <laughs> Dave, you look very sharp. So, yes. As we go to God in prayer, um, let us read from Psalm 95, uh, and we'll also do our intercessory prayer as well um, in our morning prayer. I will start us off, and then um, you can um, read along when your part comes. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountains he belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Glory, if only you would hear his voice. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen? Amen. Let's close your eyes and bow our heads. Oh God, 
all the glory, honor, and praise to you. You are the final word. And you have spoken to us through your son, Jesus, whom you have appointed heir of all things and through whom you created the universe. So we praise you, O oh God, that through your son, Jesus, you reveal to us and to all humanity that you are Emmanuel, God with us. You are God, fully God, and with us, fully human, through your son. And we praise you that you came down to us as a baby, just like us, so that you can live the life we could not live, and to die the death we could not die. And through your death and your resurrection, you have given us true hope and true peace. Thanks be to God. We praise you, O oh God, for you are our creator, our sustainer, and our redeemer. You hold all power in your hands. And at the same time, you love us to the point where you would lay down your one and only son for us. Help us understand that. Help us feel that. Help us be transformed by that good news that you took upon the wrath, the injustice, and the sins of the world and our sin, and you died in our place. Thank you, Lord. And that's what we celebrate this Advent season. Lord, that's why we are here today. In our response, in gratitude, we praise you, almighty God. And we are so thankful unto you, our holy, just, and loving God. Oh well, God, forgive us for our sins and failures this week. We confess how we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We humbly repent and we ask that you will restore our relationship back to you and to any we might have sinned against. Oh God, we pray for those who are struggling in mind, body, and spirit. There are so many and you know them all. Oh God, we lift up the Fitzgerald family to you. Be with David, oh God, and his family. And we know, Lord, we have the assurance, as we said, true hope and true peace. We know that Jill is in your hands, rejoicing and praising in your name. But we grieve and we mourn, oh God, so please bring your comfort and peace. We pray for Russ. Thank you that he is here with us. And we pray for a fast and quick recovery, Lord, to heal him. Lord, we pray for the Korovo family. Lord, please be with them and bring them your peace and your comfort. We pray for George Menti, Lord, that you bring your quick and healthy recovery, Lord, to his body, that he may continue your work, O oh Lord, we pray for Jan Shaw, oh God, that you would bring your quick and healthy reco recovery to her body. She may join us again, worshiping you, and she is worshiping you now, we know, oh God. It doesn't matter where we are at, Lord, we can worship you, Lord, anytime, any place. And you know all those, all the needs, all the ones that are hurting. Bring your comfort and peace, O oh God. We lift up our petitions and our requests. You heard them, O oh God, and you know them. You, Lord, we pray for your divine hand, your divine intervention in all these circumstances. And we know that you can provide. And we also pray, whether it's through medical experts or other ways, O oh God, we pray for your healing, and your power, your peace, your mercy. Hear our prayers and be with those that are struggling and those who can help and be the hands and feet of Jesus. May you use us, God, to bless others, to share the good news, to bring your healing and your encouragement and your peace to this broken world. And we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for our church body and all our 
church members and people here online and here and wherever they may be, Lord, we come together in one mind, in one spirit, in one heart to worship you, God, to love others, to, to grow your followers, oh God. Use us. What a privilege it is to come together. And we have <coughs> victory in you. And we praise you. We thank you for that. Through your son, Jesus. May we encounter him today in this worship, O oh God. Encounter him together corporately <coughs> as the body of Christ. Now let us pray the way Jesus has taught us. Our Father, Amen. who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand.
What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Father God, as we await the coming of the celebration of the birth of your son, and we also await the not yet kingdom, we praise and we thank you for who you are, for how you love us. Father, help us each and every day to take a step closer to you. Father, we thank you for these gifts that have been offered this morning to further the work of your already kingdom here in this church. Help us to use those gifts wisely and well, that you might be glorified. Father God, as we come this morning ready to receive you both in the word from our pastor, as well as at your table. We lift up to you those things that we should not have done, or those things that we have not done, that we should have done. We confess them to you quietly in our hearts right now. your word tells us that when we confess our sins that you are faithful and just to forgive us. We receive that forgiveness. We praise and we thank you for that forgiveness. Father, I lift up the children as they go out for Kids Church this morning that you would also help them to understand the deep mystery of Advent, of the coming of your son, that they might take us step closer. I ask you to be with Sam and Annalise as they lead them this morning, that you will grant them wisdom and guidance. Father, we lift all of this up to you in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Kids, you can go out for kids' church. Lots of obstacles with all the men's stuff, all the men's choir. <laughs> Ever have things uh, turn out not exactly as you expect? All the time. And sometimes that's a good thing, but sometimes that's not such a good thing. Uh, but either way, it's always challenging when uh, you sort of think things are supposed to go away a certain thing and then a certain way, and then they, they change. Now, Joseph, um, in the Christmas story, he is a case study in things turning in ways that are unexpected. And especially when God is involved, that when God is involved, he can, and when he is with us and in a certain situation, he can turn circumstances, situations in a way that you don't expect. Ways that you've never dreamed. In fact, when Joseph was confronted with the fact that Mary was pregnant, he couldn't dream that this would actually be, God would be behind this. And because he couldn't dream of it, guess what God did? He appeared to Joseph in a dream through an angel and said, no, I am in this. I am with you. And so we're in this series called a, a Story Bigger Than Your Own. And Christmas, this Christmas season, it is a reminder that God is, uh, has a story bigger than our own, that Joseph needed that reminder as well, that God is doing something bigger than just you and your relationship, Joseph, and he's calling us into that story that is bigger than our own. So we're in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. The New Testament starts with four what are called Gospels. Those are narratives of Jesus' life, his teachings, and his death. 
and we were going through Matthew, and we um, skipped. We started with chapter 1, and then we skipped some, went to chapter 3 when we started this series because we knew Christmas is coming, and on Christmas we'll return to chapters 1 and 2, which talk about Jesus' birth. But we still want to make sure we know about the context, right? Since we're jumping back, that's right. So, uh, Matthew 1, verses 1 through 17, which we read several when we started this series, is a genealogy where, you know, this person begat that person, begat that person. And this is Matthew, the gospel writer, his very Jewish way of placing Jesus at the center of God's big story. That Jesus was a descendant of Abraham and King David and these were two men who were central in what God was doing with the Jewish people, central to the story of God and his people. And God promised that one day he would send a savior, a Messiah, that would be a descendant of Abraham and King David. So when Matthew talks about Jesus and his descendants, it's his way of saying, yes, Jesus, he's at the center of God's big story. And then in verse 18, which Marco read, when we start verse 18 through 25, Matthew moves on to how Jesus' birth was remarkable, not just because of his ancestry, but also how it actually happened. But in all of this, Matthew is showing us that Jesus' birth, that Christmas, calls us to that story bigger than our own. It's a story of God with us, and that if God is present, then he can bring salvation and redemption even in the most dire situations. And as the author of the story of the universe, God can rewrite, rewrite our stories and our circumstances. And so today's passage, it tells us about a turning point in God's epic story, Jesus' conception. But it tells us the story of Jesus' conception from Matthew's perspective, whereas, uh, excuse me, from uh, Joseph's perspective, uh, whereas Luke's gospel tells the story of Jesus' conception from Mary's perspective. So let's imagine, let's imagine Joseph. A couple of days before the passage, uh, our scripture passage that was read when he found out Mary was pregnant, a couple of days before that, imagine what was going through his mind. He was probably happy. He was excited that he would be about to begin a new chapter in his life. He had found a, a devoted, devout young woman named Mary and they were going to start a family together. They were betrothed. Now, there's a word you don't hear much, betrothed. Well, that's because we don't do that uh, in our culture. But what is betrothal? It's, it's like an engagement, but it's a lot more serious than that. In that day, in that age, when you were betrothed to someone, basically you were legally bound to that person but you didn't yet live together and you don't, definitely didn't yet consummate the marriage. So Joseph and Mary, their families came together and they promised one another, they, they were betrothed. They were engaged. And in fact, it would take a divorce, a legal divorce to break a betrothal. So it wasn't quite marriage, but it was real serious. Well, anyways, Joseph wasn't thinking about any of that stuff because he was just excited he was looking forward to that day that, okay, all the promises have been made, the families have gotten together, and I'm just waiting for that day when Mary and I will go into the same household and, and start a family. So he was so excited about that, and I'm sure he went to bed at night thinking, God has blessed him so abundantly. Joseph's heart was overflowing with expectations. But then, when we pick up our scripture reading in verse 18, it's betrayal. Betrayal. Joseph, he could not believe it. I mean, how could he be so wrong about Mary? Because Mary was pregnant. During the time when they were waiting for one another, when they had promised one another, to, waiting to give themselves to one another, she gave herself to another? 
And then to top it all off, she tries to say that, oh, this is a miracle from God. How disgusting to use their common faith as a cover for her godless deeds. Now, Joseph, I am sure he was hurt. He was angry. But he was also a kind man. And he didn't want revenge. He didn't want Mary to be shamed her whole life. He didn't want Mary to be stoned as an adulteress, which was what the law called for. So as Joseph laid his head down to rest after a gut-wrenching day, he decided, all right, I'm going to divorce Mary. I'm going to call this whole thing off. I'm going to do it quietly, though. I'll make arrangements to do this privately. That's what he decided when he laid his head down to sleep that night. But that's when, in his dreams, an angel appeared and said, and this is verse 20, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. God shows up through this angel in Joseph's life and says, I'm in this. Jo Joseph, I am with you. I am in this. Mary is telling the truth. The Savior that you've been waiting for, the Savior that Mary's been waiting for, the Savior that the whole world has been waiting for, and the one who would save people, not just save people from whatever the latest empire is, Rome or the Assyrians, or not just someone who would save people from that, but someone who would save us from our sins, those things that separate us from God. That Savior is in the belly of your betrothed. So Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And notice, he calls Joseph son of David. You're like, oh, so Joseph's dad was named David? No, it actually wasn't. But here, the angel is pointing out, Joseph, your ancestor is David, King David. And so when you take Mary as your wife, when you take this child as your own, he will legally be a descendant of David. So, Joseph, can you add it all up? That this child is a descendant of David. This child will be conceived of the Holy Spirit. This is the child that you've been waiting for. And what, Joseph, what you thought was the worst day of your life is actually the most meaningful day of your life. It's the most meaningful day that the world has ever seen because this event is bigger than your own story. This event is bigger than your relationship with Mary, your hopes, your dreams. This story is bigger than it all. This is God's story unfolding in the belly of your betrothed. And at this point, Matthew enters back into the story. <laughs> So we, we hear about, you know, Joseph and what angels was in his dialogue with Joseph. But then in the scripture, Matthew, the, the writer of the gospel, enters back into the story to point out how this event, it also fulfills prophecy. And as we've talked about in this series, Matthew is constantly quoting Old Testament um, scripture that was written hundreds of years before and saying these events, they fulfill what God said back then. And the reason he's doing that all the time is because he wants to show these events are a part of God's bigger story. That because God writes the story, even though things go way back here, he foreshadows it. He tells us, hey, expect this. And then later, it happens. And he's doing that to show that, yeah, God is the author of this big story, and he's in charge of it. And all of these things that are happening, they're a part of a fulfillment. So he says in verse 22, Matthew, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. He translates it for us in case we don't know. This child is God with us. And remember, what did, what did the angel tell Joseph that his name would be? Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh is salvation. 
So his, his names tell us who he is and what he's going to do. This child is God with us to save us. Say that with me. God with us to save us. Emmanuel, Jesus. It's a, such a universe-shaking truth. And yet, it enters, this truth enters history in the common things of life. A marriage, a birth, a betrothal. Things that have happened millions of times on earth. And yet, because God is involved, there is an eternal weight of divine mystery and truth hidden in that relationship between two peasants from a small town of a small country 2,000 years ago. The words of the angel, so simple, reveal a mind-boggling truth about this child, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Wait, this, this child is conceived by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. This child is God with us. This child is God? Fully God. And yet, this child will be the son of man, the, the descendant of King David, a human, the descendant of Abraham from the, the womb of a peasant woman named Mary. Fully man. Now, Matthew doesn't go into all the big theology of Jesus being fully God and fully man. He just sort of describes this kind of stuff. <laughs> but this is a theological truth of such weight that theologians have literally written tons of books on this subject. And when I say literally, I mean literally. A lot of people use that term now, oh, literally, but they don't mean it. No, I mean that if you were to weigh all the books written about Jesus being God and man, uh, they would weigh over 2,000 pounds, easy. One of the reasons is not just because it's a mind-blowing truth, but what it means, what it means for us that, that he is fully God, that means Jesus can pay the infinite debt that we owe to God. Because God is an infinite being, and even a small sin against an infinite God would should be, mean an infinite debt that we would owe. It's kind of like when we, if we were to commit a crime against the president, right, we would have a, a larger um, penalty than if just some other person. Why? Well, because it's, it's of their, their status, so too, if we're an infinite God who is infinitely good and infinitely holy, only God himself can forgive those sins against him. And so fully God, he can, he can deal with that eternal debt that we owe. And yet, he's fully man. He can truly represent us. That when God looks to humanity, he can see his son, Jesus, as being fully man, representing us. No longer are we represented by Adam and his sin. We can be represented by Jesus, the perfect, perfect intermediary, bringing God and people together once again, reconciling God and people for eternity. You see, so that idea of Jesus being fully God, fully man, it's not just a doctrine that we have to check off. It is a truth that makes our reconciliation with God possible. But let's remember the situation. Because some of you, I know, you said, oh, those are, that's big doctrine stuff, and you stopped paying attention. Uh, and others of you are like, yeah, that's good. Give me some more doctrine. All right, well, how about, um, let's go a middle road. And that's, let's remember the situation. Because all of that, that, that heavy truth, that amazing truth in what God was doing, let's go back to Joseph. Because he thought, well, this is the worst situation that could ever happen to him, right? Be before he was told about this truth. He thought this situation was the worst thing that ever happened to him, I'm sure. And he couldn't even look to the political situation because at that time, Rome was oppressing Israel. So it's not, so everything was bad for Joseph. The, the Romans were oppressing, uh, his fiancés betrayed him. But because God was with Joseph, because he was present in this child, 
things were so much different than they just appeared on the surface. The epic story of God was unfolding quietly behind the scenes, quietly in the belly of Mary's womb. But Joseph, he couldn't see it. He couldn't perceive it because everything was obscured by sin, injustice, suffering. And that always draws our attention. The bad stuff always draws our attention so that we can't often see what God is doing in the background. And so how about you this Christmas? Maybe that is your story. Perhaps you feel overwhelmed by what's going on in your story. Family issues, financial issues, health issues. You can't see how God is with you. You're stuck in your story. But this is where the Christmas story rings out and says Christ's birth is a part of God's bigger story. And he invites you into that story. A story bigger than your own, so that even in the midst of turmoil, even in the midst of confusion, you have a trust that, wait, God is with us to save us. That's what Christmas is about. God is with us to save us, even if I can't see it because my situation is so bad. But God, we must remember, and Christmas speaks of this, God can work on such a level that we, that we can't even perceive and his intelligence and, and what he's doing is so big that often we don't get how he is with us to save us, especially if we're in a situation that there could be pain. I was reminded of this um, this week when I like to watch documentaries and stuff, and I have to do it myself because Wendy doesn't like that. She's like, ah, you're watching a documentary. But I like nature documentaries, and I was watching one about rhinos, Okay. Now, rhinos are, are almost, we got a picture of the rhino? Yes. Rhinos are almost extinct, right? And I was watching, I said, oh, that's sad. The rhinos are almost extinct. And then I noticed that they, they came on, and they were these um, conservationists. They put the, the rhino, they sedated the rhino, and then they cut his horn off. And I was thinking, well, that, that doesn't make sense. Why would you cut off a rhino's horn? That's his, like, way that he protects himself. And I'm sure the rhino was thinking, hey, why are you cutting off my horn? <laughs> I need that. Well, what the, the big picture is that these conservationists were actually saving the rhino. Why? Well, because poachers. The, the rhino doesn't have many predators, but the biggest predator is people who kill the rhino and take its horn. And so by removing the horn, it actually protects the rhino. See, this just, it, it, it was an example to me of how, of how God often, he is with us to save us. And sometimes things happen in ways where we're like, I don't understand how that works, God. How, how can you, it doesn't seem like you're with me to save me when this is going on. But there's, God has a bigger story. There's also plenty of other examples in the Bible of God working in a situation and turning things because he has a bigger story. I think of the other Joseph, all right? There's Joseph, um, uh, Jesus' uh, um, earthly father, but then there's Joseph, who in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, his brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt. And if you read the whole story, God ends up using Joseph to save his whole family from famine. And when... Joseph's brothers um, sort of come face to face with Joseph. They're very scared. Uh, but Joseph reassures him, and he says, what God, uh, what, what you intended for evil, God has used for good. He has turned the situation. And Joseph, I'm sure, at first couldn't see the situation, how God could use it, but he did. See, when God is with us, he can save us. But often that salvation is on a scale bigger than our own story, bigger than ourselves. So we can't see it sometimes for generations, but also sometimes not even on this side of heaven. But Jesus' conception, his birth, what Christmas does is it pulls back the, the curtain on the eternal story that God has been writing. And it's a story bigger than any one of us. It's a story than, bigger than any one nation. And so, yes, many things might seem hopeless. So many things disturb us and disturb our peace. So as uh, we were right, lighting the peace candle this week, you might have thought, oh, that's nice, light a candle, but 
I am so unsettled. I am not at peace because of, of whatever's going on. And again, what happens? Fear draws our attention. It does. And, and it causes us to only see what's right there instead of what God is doing on a bigger level. And we live in a media-saturated environment where they, they know fear will draw our attention. Like, that's a natural human thing. If we're scared of something, if we're, if we're disturbed, we'll pay attention. And so they play up the fear. Whatever you fear, they highlight that to get your attention. And indeed, our lives are saturated by things trying to get our attention, make us fear, death, betrayal, injustice, the immorality of the world around us. And our stories can seem overwhelmed by it all. And like Joseph, when Joseph laid down his head that night, and he was thinking, God, where are you in this? My fiance betrayed me. The Romans are oppressing us. Government's all messed up. God, my story is not what I expected. And that's when God, God answered Joseph in a dream. That's also when we feel that. When we're, if you're thinking that now, that is God is answering us right now. And he's saying, your story is not what you expected. That's true. But it's so much more because I am with you. That's the Christmas story. That's, you say, you know, God spoke to Joseph in a dream, but the reason that you're here today, the reason that this was written in these scriptures is because God is saying the same thing to you today. I am with you. I am in this child. I am writing a grand story of salvation for my people. Yeah, you might not be able to see it through your hurt, through your confusion, but don't be afraid. He said that to Joseph. Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary and this child because this Jesus is Emmanuel. This Jesus will save us because God is with us. This is God who is with us to save us. So yes, we might not be seeing the whole story. We can't fathom the divine mystery of fully God and fully human in this child. I, I can't fully understand it myself. But we don't need to understand it to take it as a gift. To live in light of that story. To not fear. To take that step of trust in God and what he is doing. Because that's what Joseph did. He took this child as his own. And that's what we're invited to do this Christmas. To take this Christ child as our Emmanuel, as our Savior, as our story. Will you do that today? As God is pulling back the curtain on his story that he's been writing, receive that child. And if you have already said, yes, I have trusted in Jesus. He is my Emmanuel. He is my Savior, right? You, tr you know his names. You trust his names. Good. Now, recommit to that. This Christmas, that, no, God, uh, you are with me to save me. Because I'll bet that you're going through something this year, this Christmas, that you weren't going through five years ago, ten years ago. Well, God is still with you to save you. And so recommit to that child. And as we go to take the Lord's Supper, right, that's what we're doing. Next, okay, you were hopefully given a little cup and with a wafer and juice. Why, one of the reasons that Christians observe the Lord's Supper is because it reminds us of God is with us to save us, but from the other side of the story. When Jesus was born, his, his story is he walks his life and lives his life, he dies on a cross. He his body is broken, his blood is shed for us. And so if we were to just go a few pages to, to Matthew, all right, we, the beginning of Matthew talks about Jesus' conception. Well, in Matthew 26, Matthew tells the story of Jesus. He's an adult. He's about to be betrayed, 
and die on a cross. Again, he's about to fulfill who he is in what, that he's God with us, and yet he's God to save us. He's going to give his life on our behalf. And when we take the bread in, when we take the cup in, it's as a Christian saying, yes, God, you are my Emmanuel. Jesus, you're my Savior. You uh, are, are God's, um, God's gift to me. So anyways, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was eating with his followers. And it says, um, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So we take this bread in remembrance of Jesus' broken body. We take, eat, in remembrance of him. And then it says, and then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He take, drink the cup in remembrance of Jesus' shed blood for our sins. Let's pray. Dear God, we've taken the bread and the cup as our confession of faith that, Lord Jesus, you are God with us to save us. And you weren't just born as a baby and lived a good, cushy, cushy life of a king. You gave your life for us. Your body was broken. Your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And so, Lord, we rejoice. We rejoice that you have taken our sins and removed them as far as the east is from the west. Lord, that you have saved us. And on this Christmas, we pray that that truth wouldn't just be something we think about now, but, Lord, we would live in that truth that you are with us to save us. And, Lord, we lift up all the things that we're going through right now, and we pray that you would show us how you are working in these situations. But Lord, even if we can't see, we trust you because you gave your life. You were not the one who just said, oh, you deal with it, people. You came down and dealt with it. Dealt with our sin. Dealt with the injustice and the betrayals of this world. So we thank you, Lord, and pray that we would go and, and, and live out this truth of Christmas. But we thank you for that truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you stand and join us, please.
God, as we go from this place, we go praising you that you are with us to save us. Lord, you're not just with us to save us here in this building as we gather. You're with us to save us in the difficulties of the world, the hardships of life, And we pray, God, that we would go in that knowledge. It would change how we look at ourselves, how we relate to you, how we live our life. And we thank you and praise you on Christmas that you are with us to save us. In Jesus' name, amen.